let's start. Uh, Dr. Amit Gupta uh, and dear participants, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's webinar on the future of American power. I think the topic is of great relevance today. At the time when there are debates that post COVID-19, the international order might be changed. Even Kissinger came with a similar article. Uh, there's also one section, uh, maybe it's a small section that also argue that maybe China will take over. Uh, they fail to understand that America, uh, the way America has reached around the world. Um, to talk on this, uh, we have very distinguished person, uh, Dr. Amit Gupta. I would like to thank him for his time, and I also like to welcome him for this discussion. I got an opportunity to present to him at Delhi at several occasions, and I think the last one was in Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies, New Delhi. Dr. Amit Gupta uh, is an associate professor in the USAF Air War College, Alabama. He, his writing has have focused on arms production and weapons proliferation, South Asia and Australia security policies, diaspora politics, popular culture and politics, and more recently on US-China rivalry and the impact of demography on US foreign policy. His articles have appeared in Orbis, Asian Survey, Security Dialogue, The Roundtable, and Mediterranean Quarterly. He is also the author or editor of seven books, and most recently, recent of which are Air Power, The Next Generation, published by Howgate Publishing, uh, Maritime Heritage and Challenges in the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific, co-edited with Howard Hansen, and published by Rotlis. Uh, so you have 30, maximum 40 minutes to make your presentation, followed by question and answer. I'd also like to request all our participants to drop their questions in the chat box or comment box or on Facebook Live. Uh, you can also tweet your questions on contact nice and uh, Dr. Gupta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. And thank you for organizing this. I do want to say that it's remarkable how COVID-19 has reshaped the way we do business. And it's, it's an opportunity. You know, the last time I was in Kathmandu was in 2011. And I didn't think I would come back for five years more probably around 2025, but I've come back five years before. You know? And that makes me feel very good. Now, what I want to talk about today is simply this, that what you've seen for the last 30 years or so, since 1991, is a unipolar world order. It is a world order in which the United States had military primacy, and thanks to globalization, it had economic primacy. Both military primacy and economic primacy are now being contested. And today's discussion is on what is the contestation? What is the American response? What are the constraints? And what is the likely outcome? And here's what you have to keep in mind. Why is this constraint? Why is this contestation? Oh, sorry. Why is this contestation a problem for the United States? And the answer is, it's not so much about unipolarity. Unipolarity is important. If you look at every American president, they have made the same point that America will lead world order with purpose, and they've been saying this since 1991-92 when the Soviet Union collapsed. What is important is, since 91, the Bretton Woods United Nations system that was set up in 1945 has essentially been the template on which world order has been based. And with the rise of China, with the revival of Russia, there is a concern that this Bretton Woods UN liberal international order will be challenged. And let me get to what is going on. If you look at it, from 1991, the United States has had military supremacy. And that military supremacy has rested on the fact that technologically it's been far ahead of other countries. 
it has also divided the world up into combatant commands. And for each command, forces are committed. For each command, there is a strategy. And I'll show you Indo-Pacific Command in a minute. Now, what has happened is, for the last 10 years or so, or actually more than that, for the last 20 years or so, it's been very clear in Washington that what you're seeing is a rise of China. And as China rises, the question in Washington became, how do you deal with it? And the first person who talked about this was George Walker Bush, who said, China is our strategic competitor. This was said in April of 2000. And then of course in, oh, sorry, in April of 2001. And then of course you had September 2001 and America's security perimeters changed quite dramatically. Barack Obama did the same thing. He said, we have to pivot to Asia. Well, he pivoted to Asia only to pivot back to the Middle East because things blew up with the Arab Spring and everything else there. Now, Donald Trump has made China the number one focus of his administration. It is seen as a foreign policy challenge. It's seen as an economic challenge. It's seen as a military challenge. And unlike the Obama administration and the Bush administration, what Trump has done is Trump is moving away from this large military footprint that the United States had, particularly in the Middle East, and I would argue even in Europe, to focus on the Indo-Pacific. Okay? This is what is the shift that's taking place. And let me show you, this is what is called Indo-PACOM now. It used to be called Asia Pacific Command, that went away. It became Indo-Pacific Command, and it was called Indo-Pacific Command to accept two things. One was that China was a central strategic focus of the United States, and the second was the rise of India. Okay? And what the American national security strategy says is very clear. It says what has happened is China has built up its military capacity to the extent that it might be able to conduct certain military actions. And therefore, the United States should be able to change its own military force structure to deal with this change in Chinese capabilities. And as the uh, national security strategy says, what you're worried about is that Beijing thinks that it can use its lim a limited use of its theater nuclear capabilities or any other use of nuclear weapons, and that the United States would acquiesce to this. So what has happened is the U.S. has actually started to change its military forces, not to fight a war, but to deter a war. Remember one thing, that what is coming out of both Beijing and Washington is not talk about, oh, we're headed down the path to another world war. What they're both saying is that there is a concern that we may have another Cold War, which is something very different. But what is the US doing to essentially bring about greater deterrence in the Indo-Pacific? And it's several things. One getting more fighter aircraft, getting more cruise missiles, especially a long range cruise missile, modifying a small number of existing submarine launched ballistic missiles with low yield weapons. A low yield weapon can then take out military targets. It's not meant to take out cities. And the whole idea in doing this is, if you look at the growth of naval forces, is to recognize that in Asia, there are certain countries which are going to say, we want America in Asia, we want China in Asia, but do not ask us to choose sides. And somebody asked me a question on this and I'll explain it to you at length. Now, the other problem is the US sees it as Russia. And again, what has happened with Russia is very clear that both Obama and Trump say the same thing. 
that Russia is not the primary problem. It is something which is out there. And the Russians are much weaker. The, the Russian economy is about the size of the economy of the American state of Ohio. You know? It's that small. But the Russians have been focusing on building a range of nuclear weapons. Now, given that fact, the US in itself is responding by, again, raising the deterrence level by changing its nuclear force. You aren't seeing a contestation of Russian territory, rollback of Russia, all these things that some people talk about. It's actually a very cautious policy. But this is the military side of it. Now let me get to what will be of more interest to all of you. What they're talking about is, this is a long-term policy, but it has multiple constraints. And let me go down the list on these constraints. There is the cost factor. It's going to cost a lot of money to build up this new deterrent. There's the cost of maintaining a force structure and a global presence. There is the demographic shift in America. There is the generational shift in America. There is also a military political shift as America moves from NATO to the Indo-Pacific. And in that, the other issue is can NATO project military power beyond the European region. And I'll get to all of these in a second. Now, to talk about the first part in this, which is the cost of nuclear forces and so on, the cost of nuclear modernization is actually quite large, but manageable. It's $490 billion over a 10-year period, so that's about $49 billion a year, which falls within the US defense budget. The problem in the long run, though, is this. The US defense budget this year is 738 billion. You need to add to this something called the Veterans Administration Bill. That is the amount the United States government pays in pensions and in the health care for its former soldiers, its veterans. And that is now at 220 billion. To give you an idea, when I had first joined the United States uh, Air Force, the VA bill was about five or six billion. This was back in early 2001. In 19 years, look at how much this has increased. And the point you all need to keep in mind is a large chunk of this Veterans Administration bill is healthcare costs. Because what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq is a lot of very young people in their 20s lost an arm, lost a leg, got a metal plate in their head. This is when they were in their 20s, when they were the most physically fit they were ever going to be. They're now entering their 40s. In another 10, 15 years, they'll enter their 50s and 60s. If you talk to medical specialists, they say the cost of looking after somebody goes up exponentially. What do I mean by that? If I'm spending $1 on somebody in their 20s, I'll be spending $2 when they reach their 40s, $4 when they reach their 60s. So this $220 billion budget could actually expand to maybe four or $500 billion. Nobody knows how much it's going to go up to. And that then brings up the next question when you look at cost, and that is, how do you pay for all this? And the secular trend across administrations since the time of Ronald Reagan has been to reduce taxes. So if you're going to reduce taxes, how do you pay for all this? And one way to pay for all this was to get foreign donors or foreign nations to buy American treasury bills. And to give you an idea of how big this is, take a look at these numbers. Uh, these are the numbers from August 2019. I'm, I couldn't find the numbers for March 2020, but it's close enough. As you can see, the Japanese have 1.1 trillion in uh, American treasury bills. The Chinese have 1.1 trillion. And then you see a dramatic drop from the number of people who bought American treasury bills. So 
Britain has 349 billion, Brazil has 311 billion, and I put India in because it's in the region with 162 billion. But if there's any Indians watching this, what you need to keep in mind is Belgium, which is the 10th highest investor in American treasuries, has 217 billion. And Belgium has a population of about 10 million people. That's about half the population of the Delhi, New Delhi metropolitan area. And Luxembourg has 240 billion. And Luxembourg is half a million people. So it is 1 20th the population, oh, sorry, 1 40th the population of the New Delhi metropolitan area. Now, so cost in the long run is going to be a problem, especially for one thing which we never factored in, and that was COVID-19. COVID-19 for all Western nations is the black swan because Everywhere across Western nations now, people are asking the question, what are you going to do to ensure that your citizenship is protected? And protection means ventilators, protection means hospital beds, protection means vaccines, protection means all kinds of other processes, but they all mean money. And you know, to give you a very clear example of this, the British talk a lot about how they're still a world power. After Boris Johnson went to the ICU in Britain, they've begun to realize that they're going to have to spend a lot more money on their national healthcare system. And the question in the Western world is, if you're spending more on healthcare, how much can you afford to spend on defense? And the answer is not much. The other constraint that's coming in the United States, which is something I've been working on now for about five years, is that of demography and a generational shift. And let me explain this. The United States is unique because in the next 25 years, the minorities in America become the majority. Who are the minorities? Hispanics, so that's Mexicans and other Latin Americans, Asians, African Americans. By 2045, America's population will be 50.4% minority and 49.6% majority. So the majority becomes the minority. And by 2024, which is four years from now, 50% of the school children in America will be minorities. Now, I'm not making up these figures, these figures come from the Census Bureau of the United States of America. And the Census Bureau of the United States of America bases these calculations on who is already born and lives in the United States. Okay? So it's not projections on, well, maybe people will have more children, maybe people will live longer, nothing like that. It's going with existing death rates and existing numbers of population in the US. And I'll say one more thing, which is not apparent to all of you. The median age for white people in America is 50. The median age for Latinos, that is Mexicans and other Latin Americans, is 19. And median age is 50% above, 50% below. So ask yourself, what is the future that is coming? And you know, one of the interesting things is, if you look at the old America, the old America was Eurocentric because people would go to Europe during college. People saw Europe as their cultural home and so on. But as you see this new minority majority America come about, what are their cultural ties to Europe? Their cultural ties are to Latin America, their cultural ties are to Asia. And in part, this is why President Macron of France says, America is moving away from being an Atlantic nation to being a Pacific nation. Okay. Now this is one. And the other thing which is really interesting is when you poll minorities on what they see as America's view in world affairs, it is not this old idea that used to come out of what is what I call the Washington to Boston academic bureaucratic beltway. 
it's not about America's great role in the world. It's not about America's, you know, setting up world order. It is an understanding that we need to be accepting that other people will come up. We need to understand that we're not going to be sending military forces everywhere, which brings up my second point. And the second point is really interesting. Remember this, American foreign policy to this day is made by people who fall in two categories. Category number one is what is called the greatest generation, the people who were born either before World War II or during and just after World War II. And Pramod was talking about Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger is now in his 90s. You know, Henry Kissinger is an extremely old man. But the fact that Henry Kissinger still talks about world order is an interesting thing to bring up because what does that say about the next generation? What do the millennials think? And here's what you need to remember. In the next 10 years, the millennials, and the millennials are people like you. It's the people who've been born between 1981 and 1997. The millennials did... There's two things about them. Number one, in the next 10 years, they become 75% of the workforce. Because remember, baby boomers, which is the generation I fall in, were born between 1965 and, uh, sorry, 1945 and 1964. So they are becoming old very rapidly. They are retiring very rapidly. Baby boomers become 75% of the American economy. And Harvard did a survey of boomers, uh, sorry, millennials, and asked them this question. What do you think about going to war? And 60% of them said, we will not go to war under any circumstances. 20% said we will go to war under some circumstances. The next generation that's coming up in America is far more internally focused. It talks about things which are quite different from what the past generation spoke about. You know? And the question then becomes, can you have this great North Atlantic Alliance? Can you have this great Western world order? And let me show you what happens to the militaries of Europe. Now remember this, Europe was actually heavily militarized till the end of the Cold War. Um, I used to live in Sweden, and I put the numbers of Sweden up there, but the Swedes in 1988, for a population of 10 million people, could put 800,000 people into their military, both active and reserve. This is how big they were. Look at the number for Sweden now. In their army in 1977, as you can see from that, was 230,000. It's now 6,800. And their total forces are about 14,000 active, 26,000 reserve. They will never go back to the large numbers they used to have. Look at a country like Belgium. Again, a very small country, but a very large military. It has shrunk. Look at Britain, look at France. You can go down the list on that, okay? Uh, and here's the interesting one. I interviewed a German, uh, well, actually I didn't interview, I gave a lecture where there were a bunch of NATO generals there. And I know that the Germans during the Cold War had 2,000 tanks. Now they have about 311 tanks. So I asked the German general, I said, sir, in a war, how many tanks could you put out? to go to war. And, you know, the good thing about the Germans is they will tell you the truth. They'll be very accurate, even if it is painful to them. And he said 96. So where are these large numbers of European forces going to come from to fight in Europe, let alone fight around the world? And where will they be able to take casualties? Because remember one thing, I'll give you the example of Australia. In World War I, in World War II, the Australians took about 58, 59,000 
military casualties. In the Iraq war, the Australians took two. In the Afghan war, the Australians took 40. And again, I've asked the Australians this question. How many can you take? And they said, not what we did in World War II or even in Korea and Vietnam, where they lost like 300, 500 troops. The West's ability to fight all this is going away because the West is getting old. To give you an idea, the median age in Italy in the next 10 years is going to be 50. The median age in Germany is going to be 46 or 47. None of these people are going to have young populations. And ultimately, to go to war, you need young populations, which then brings up the ch challenge posed by China. And let me explain this. China as a nation is quite different in terms of what it is thinking than the old Soviet Union. The Soviet Union sought to challenge the United States globally. So the Soviet Union wanted a military presence in Latin America, which was stopped with the Cuban Missile Crisis. It had a military presence in the Pacific, so on. What the Chinese want to do is fight a high technology war in local conditions. What they mean by that is they want to be able to fight the United States in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. They're not interested in going into the North Atlantic. They're not interested in going into the South Atlantic. Yes, they are sending more naval vessels into the Indian Ocean, but even then, they recognize that to challenge the United States outside their area of comfort would be extremely expensive and extremely difficult. And the Chinese have, till recently, argued that when the Americans provide security around the world, it benefits the Chinese. What the Chinese are doing, though, is they want to reconstruct world order. And the way they are doing this is not going with militarization, which is global strike, but with globalization. And you're seeing something very interesting with globalization. In the West, with the economic collapse of 2008, with COVID-19 and so on, you're seeing this push towards deglobalization. But in China and in Asia, which have benefited hugely from globalization, you're seeing a push for more globalization. And here's the thing you have to keep in mind. Asia is 40% of global GDP, but it is 70% of the global growth now. Europe is not growing, Latin America is not growing. Go to Indonesia, go to Korea, go to Thailand, you know, and you see the huge levels of construction that are taking place. This is the future. And I'll add one more thing in this, which you need to keep in mind about the Chinese. And then I'll come to America and China in a second. Look, the Chinese are the world leaders in 5G. And 5G is going to reshape how the world works. 5G is in two parts. One part is layered 5G, which is you put 5G technology on top of 4G, and your cell phones become a lot quicker. So for the young people who are listening to this, if it takes you two minutes to download a movie on your cell phone, it's going to download in seven seconds once you get 5G. Because 5G is about 40% quicker than 4G. But that's not the interesting part in 5G. The interesting part in 5G is what's called the Internet of Things. And that is the artificial intelligence aspect of it. Driverless cars, robots that can talk to robots, facial recognition, surveillance, these kinds of things. And the Chinese have a five-year lead in this. And I will give you one word for that. It's Huawei. And you've all read this stuff that the Chinese will become old before they become rich. If they have robots running their factories, they don't have a labor shortage. You see what I'm saying here? Keep that in mind. And in essence, the Chinese are still pushing very hard for globalization. COVID-19 or no COVID-19. And somebody, you can ask me about this because I'll talk to you a bit more and I'll show you some other slides on this. The other interesting thing to again come back to the United States is there is a third demographic shift happening in America. And that is people are moving out of states into eight American states. And some of these you can figure out, California, Texas, 
um, Georgia, you know, New York, so on, Florida. The, again, the University of Virginia did a study on this and said by 2040, 50% of America's population will be in eight states. And remember, there are 50 states. And another seven states will have 25% of the population. So 15 of the 50 states will have 75% of the population. And what is the lowest common denominator? Because we're talking California, we're talking New York. These are the heavily globalized states. You know, if you look at New York's economy, if you look at the population of New York, it's heavily globalized. New York is Wall Street. New York, San Francisco, LA, their mayors will tell you that 150 languages are spoken in their city. And they're not exaggerating. Okay. So again, the question to ask is, what do you do about the other states of America? And it's really interesting. Till recently, the Chinese have been putting money into buying up small industries, malls, these kinds of things in the small states. So you may have noticed that in uh, South Dakota, there was that big uh, coronavirus outbreak in a chicken processing plant. The chicken processing plant is owned by the Chinese. And what the Chinese are doing is they're going into the places where the, you have low hanging fruit. These investments are cheap. They can give you high returns in the future. Okay. Now, this is the Chinese game plan. I've talked about the military constraints. I've talked about the economic constraints. There is one more thing that is there which we don't talk about, and that is soft power. Okay. And in soft power, the United States has a very clear advantage. And I'll give you an example of this. Pramod has seen this before. These are the top 20 universities in the world. And by the way, there are different surveys done of this. I don't use the British ones because the British ones put five British universities in the top 20. And having lectured at several British universities in my time, I go and say, I think I would like to see a different survey. This is the Chinese one. This is done by Shanghai Jiutong University. And if you look at this, 13 of the top 20 universities, uh, sorry, 16 of the top 20 universities are American. Only one is non-Western, is non-English speaking. That is the Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich. But even they do all their lectures in English now, or the vast majority of their lectures in English. This is America's huge, global intellectual labor capability. And what I want you all to remember is America has profited since the, from, you know, the creation of the atomic bomb by bringing in foreign intellectual labor. So who built the atomic bomb? A lot of these scientists had names like Enrico Fermi, Leo Zillard, and they were born in countries like Italy and Hungary. They were not born in America. Then you have the space program. And the man who did the Apollo mission was Werner von Braun, who developed the German U-2 rockets, V-2 rockets, sorry, not U-2s. Third, you now have Silicon Valley. 15% of the Silicon Valley startups have been done by Indian Americans. And you look at who is in that. Google is now run by an Indian American called Sundar Pichai. Microsoft is run by an Indian American called Satya Nadella. These are among the biggest internet companies in the world. Okay. This is America's foreign intellectual labor. And to give you an idea, the West still predominates here. And let me show you what I mean by this. These are the top 500 universities in the world. America is 137, but the Chinese are beginning to understand this. And Pramod, I'd be interested in your views on this since you've been to China and you've seen the universities there. They only had nine in the top 500 in 2003. They now have 66. They are escalating. And I have a friend, I have a friend Emilian Kowalski, who teaches at uh, Nottingham Ningbo University. You know, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. 
and his dean came to him and said, Emilian, here's a $250,000 grant for you to work with. And Emilian started laughing. And you know what he says is, we are social scientists. This is too much money for people like us. It, that is what you give to hard scientists. But this is the kind of money that the Chinese are willing to throw to academics now because they recognize the importance of academic power and soft power. And look at the change that has happened. But if you look below the Americans and the Chinese, it's all European countries, you know, Germany and Australia and so on. And I put the Netherlands in there because I've studied at two Dutch universities. What's interesting is Singapore gets two with a population of five million. India only has one, the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And as I always tell people in India, you know, if you want to talk knowledge economy, then you need to go up the food chain in this. With one, you cannot be a knowledge economy. You need to have 50 to 60 universities in the top 500. And here's the last part of soft power, if I can get it up, there we go. This is the countries with the most international students in the world. The US has a million, the UK has 496,000. Look at where China is today, it's 492,000. It was, if you looked at Chinese universities 20 years ago, it would have been under 100,000. Exponentially, you're seeing a Chinese challenge in soft power, academic power, intellectual power, call it what you may. And, you know, I'll say something about Russia very briefly, and then I'll get to ending with America, and then I'll happily take questions. Look, Russia, President Obama said this, President Trump also says this, the challenge is asymmetric. The real issue is China. And asymmetric is it's cyber warfare, these kinds of things, fake news. You all know this, I'm not going to get into this. You know? um, my own sense is the Europeans are going to have to work out what they want their relationship to, with Russia to be. And keep this in mind that very recently, President Trump announced that he's pulling 9,000 troops from Germany. And the reason for that is twofold. One is, do you really need them there? And we can debate that. But the second thing is, he has been talking repeatedly about getting NATO to pay more for its defense. You know, I'll give you an example. Every NATO country is supposed to pay 2% of its GDP. Only four of them do. Uh, Britain, Greece, Poland, and I think it's Estonia. Okay. But Germany doesn't, Italy doesn't, Spain doesn't, France doesn't. And just to give you an idea, Spain pays 0.92% of GDP for its NATO uh, commitments. For it to go to 2% of GDP on its defense budget, it would almost have to double its defense budget. Which country in the world is ever going to double its defense budget? You know, nobody in the world can do that. So we, we're talking about a NATO and a Russia which really are going to have to sit down and decide how they want to play this game. We're talking about a Russia which is not an economic power. Let me say something very clearly about the Russians. In 1990, 30 years ago, what were the Soviet Union's major exports? It was commodities like iron ore, copper, oil. It was weapons. It was vodka. What is Russia's major exports now? It is commodities, oil, so on, iron ore, copper. It is weapons. It is vodka, caviar. And they've added one thing. They've become cyber criminals. They've become very good at doing cyber crime around the world. But cybercrime is not something on which you build an economy. Cybercrime is a nuisance. You can't have a multinational corporation which does cybercrime. So my point to you is, Russia is not the great world power it was 40 years ago as a Soviet Union. 
It is now really between the United States and China, which brings me to the future of American power. And here's what I think. I think you see an America which is going to be less interventionist. You see a debate that's going to come about in the US, and it's already there, which is how much do we spend on defense? What should our commitments be? And luckily for the US, neither China nor Russia have the technological capability to become global competitors in the next 10 to 15 years. After that, who knows? American military technological superiority remains. And you know, if you read Chinese military readings, they are very clear on this. They say, if there is a war in the South China Sea, we lose. But the question then becomes, can the US stay in the South China Sea for 50 years or 100 years, as it stayed with NATO? And that's a different debate, okay? Let me end by what I think is coming. And what I think is coming is what used to be Bretton Woods and the United Nations is, and a Western world order is going to become world order. As the West becomes older, as it loses its capability to project military power, you are going to see a new group of nations emerge which reconstruct world order. And who are those new groups of nations? It's going to be countries like Brazil, South Korea, India, South Africa, Indonesia, Nigeria, and especially the Chinese. And you're seeing this in their concerns about things like what to do with the IMF, what to do with the UN, how to reshape the Bretton Woods system. And I'll give you two examples. You all know there's something called the G4, which is Japan, Germany, India, Brazil. And what they're pushing for is to bring these four countries into the UN as permanent members of the Security Council. Now, there is an article by Corey Shake, who's an influential American defense analyst, who says, oh, if you bring in the BRICS countries into the IMF, you reduce the importance and value of the Europeans, and so on. This is zero-sum game thinking. The G4 are not saying, bring in the Germans and the Japanese and the Indians and the Brazilians and kick out the French and the British. They're saying there are five permanent members. Let's make it nine permanent members. Similarly, the BRICS in 2015 said, let us put more money into the IMF. Now that was rejected. But now in a post COVID-19 world, it'll be interesting to see what happens. And let me remind you of this. When Dominique Strauss-Kahn was kicked out of the IMF, there was talk about who should be the replacement. And the Chinese said, uh, how about it not be a European? Because traditionally, the person who heads the IMF is a European. The person who heads the World Bank is an American. The Chinese said, how about somebody else? And you know, one of the things people say is, we want the Chinese to be stakeholders in the, in, in the world order. If you make a Chinese as the head of the IMF, the Chinese just became stakeholders. You see what I'm saying? And there is talk now of what if you make a Chinese the head of the IMF, and what if you make an American, sorry, an Indian the head of the World Bank? That then becomes a different kind of world order. And it is not a zero-sum a zero -sum world order. It's a non-zero-sum world order. And I'll end by saying two things. Look, as the West starts to control military expenditure, it will be spending more on its people. It'll be spending more on healthcare, education, and all these things, which in the long run will maintain the West's competitive advantage. And I'll end by saying this, can you really stop the shift from Western world order to world order? And my answer is good luck. I don't think it's going to happen. So, you know, when you read stuff like John Mersheimer saying why we will miss the Cold War, it's an absurd argument. Or Guilford John Eikenberry, that's his real name, by the way. You know, that's why he goes by G. John Eikenberry. So Guilford is talking about, oh, there won't be a demise of the Western world order and liberal values and all this. This is the thinking of 30 years ago. 
we now have to think of the thinking of the future. And I'll end by saying this, I'm so glad you're getting Kishore Mehbubani to come and talk to you, because Kishore is one of the people in the world who's talking about world order. And you should ask him what he thinks, because I, I believe he's highly influential. There's two more people I would suggest, promote. you ask. One is uh, Dean Chungmin Lee of uh, Yonsei University in South Korea. He has been writing about how to deal with China. And the third is the Australian Hugh White, who teaches at Australian National University, who's been saying for 10 years now that the United States and China have to come up with a new arrangement for power sharing in Asia. All right, I have finished. Can we take a one minute break because I need to get some coffee and then, you know, I'll take questions. May I suggest promote maybe three or four questions at a time because sure. people questions bleed into each other. Okay, okay. Sure. one minute break. Thank you. We would like to request all our participants to send their questions on the chat box. We have got a couple of them, but we are expecting more. Okay, I am back. It was uh, really enlightening listening to you because we, did, I, we really enjoyed the conversation. Actually, when we when we come to China and US, there is always a kind of extreme uh, argument, and basically that is where the media plays a role. That you feel that tomorrow maybe China and United States will be fighting in the Pacific with all their weapons, or the next day you feel that India is joining. So when we follow the media, especially. In the election time where it's near hand like we get this kind of perceptions but if you talk to the policy makers or academicians even in china or even in india like you feel the real situation like i mean the war or this confrontation doesn't count at all when you talk to the experts yeah. uh, if you talk to the chinese they say that be before 2049 we're not going to even compete with chinese uh, with united states right they, right. they accept that they are developing country they, they are still a developing country where a major right. part of China is still under development. They have internal issues and they have realized that and they are not going to compete United States on that front as well. They know that war is not a solution. And that is mm -hmm. the reason that they're trying to talk to Americans, try to negotiate and resolve that issue. They know that uh, maybe economically China can survive, but on political front, they know that confronting with US will be very challenging for them, even not economically, but the relations can um, make the things very difficult. Uh, coming to your question on like, yes, on research and development, Chinese has been spending heavily. I mean, uh, it's combined maybe more than what the whole Europe has spent. I think, I don't know the actual data of Europe, but oh, I yeah. think they're spending mm -hmm. very huge amount of money on research and development. Even just look at the scholarship that Chinese are providing to South Asia. It's 10,000 uh, scholarship for South Asia. And then they have already announced another 10,000 just for Pakistan. And there's overlap of that. So it's like more than 15 to 16,000 scholarships just for South Asia. And uh, they have been targeting uh, Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, second is that in terms of like uh, uh, research and development, like if there is someone who has a PhD who has two years of experience and who yeah. is below 40, means because they're targeting something longer collaboration, you can easily get a job in China. PhD holder with two years experience below 40, means you can easily get whatever you want. And, uh, and that's why like many of the American Chinese who have been settled in Europe and other parts of the United States, they're coming back because mm -hmm. they're getting 
good salary uh, in their own environment where they can save a lot. So uh, that is what the inflow of Chinese scholars coming back to China. If you go to Peking or Xinhua or any top universities, they are willing to come. If not for permanently for longer term, but maybe for five ten years, they are willing to collaborate in United in China. Uh, so, uh, infrastructure wise, China has done best. They have enough resources. Even uh, they are trying to give more weightage to universities that can have foreign students. So, they are like trying to give more weightage to foreign students. Uh, if certain universities can get more foreign students, they get a better ranking. So, they're targeting all those uh, indicators. So, I think in five, 10 years, things will change. Like, I have read that number of students that go to the United States is less than the number of students that go to China at the moment. So things are changing and, it, and I think it will change in days to come. We have, lot, we have got lots of questions. I'll club mm -hmm. three in a set. So first question is a quote by Paul Keating, former Australian Prime Minister in 2018. He said that the US for 24 years has gone without a strategy. If you are running the world and you are number one and you do not have a strategy for quarter of a century, we have a problem. So what do you think about this? This is first. Number two is President Trump believes that U.S. pays huge amount of defend uh, to defend its allies, uh, that uh, and they should either share the cost with the U.S. or be ready to protect themselves. In a in 2016 research brief published by Rand Corporation, a group of authors concluded that U.S. overseas security commitment have a statistically significant effect the U.S. bilateral trade. Your take on this? And third question is. The current U.S.-China rivalry post-COVID-19, is it real or a seasonal election drama of Trump? Okay. Um, the COVID-19 world, okay. Uh, wh what was the second again? Sorry? Second is that U.S. is asking its allies to defend themselves because they're okay. spending lots of money on that. Uh, burden sharing, burden. okay. Uh, I am in the chat. I am typing in a article I wrote, okay? And it came out on Monday. So it's about as new as it gets. It's called Trump is right about Europe. If any of you Googles that, it, it's online. So the entire publication comes up. That talks about the uh, burden sharing part. Let me start with the Paul Keating one. Here's the thing. The whole idea was that this, this thing about free markets and trickle-down economics, which people believe had worked in the United States, but it didn't really, was going to work around the world. Do you see what I'm saying? Free markets and trickle-down economics was tax cuts, uh, open trade, allow money, wealth, technology to flow across borders, and everybody will benefit. Now, what happens is with globalization, certain people definitely benefited, but large parts of the world did not, including within different parts of the world. I mean, this is something which I'll tell you, and you know then get to Paul Keating. The Federal Reserve of America did a survey. And what they found was in an emergency, 40% of Americans cannot put together $400. Then the US Census Bureau did a survey and it said 60% of Americans cannot put together $1,000 in an emergency. This is the big shift and it has to be addressed. Now, when you come to, if you take this idea of trickle-down economics and free markets applied across the world, Paul Keating's right. It wasn't a strategy. And the Chinese do have a strategy, and I've been arguing this for some time now. The Chinese have ambition, vision, resource. Well, let me rephrase that. Vision, ambition, resources. They want to put a trillion dollars into the Belt and Road Initiative. They say once that trillion dollar network is built, Around it, another $7 trillion worth of infrastructure will emerge. I think these numbers are highly overstated, but let's say they invest $250 billion. That's still better than anybody else. 
Second thing, they have the Regional Comprehensive Economic Program, which is ASEAN plus six other countries. Those are all serious countries which have come together in an economic pact. It's the Japanese, it's the Koreans, it's the Australians, it's the New Zealanders, it's the Singaporeans. You know? All these people understand this. And my argument for some time now has been, and thank you, you know, to the person who talked about Paul Keating here. Um, my argument has been you need a new American Marshall Plan. You need to be able to present a new economic vision to the world. And globalization is not enough. You know, and here's the thing. The Chinese are willing to invest in Pakistan. Nobody else is willing to invest in Pakistan. When I was in Kathmandu in 2011, the Chinese were talking about putting a ring road around Kathmandu to ease traffic congestion. Have they built that or nothing happened? Promote? They have expanded the previous one. They have not come with the new project. They okay. have expanded the previous one. Okay. But, you know, my take is this. What the Chinese are coming up with now, and, and I'll give you an example because I want you to understand the difference between little thinking and big thinking. You all know Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson wants to build a high-speed train from Manchester to London, which is 400 kilometers. The Chinese want to build a high-speed train from Beijing to London, which is 12,000 kilometers. Somebody is thinking very big. Somebody is thinking very small. And I, whenever I go and give a talk now, I keep saying the same thing. You have to create an alternative economic vision for the world. Right now, it's the Chinese who are creating that economic vision for the world. And if I may, I'm going to show you guys something. And uh, let's see where it is. I know it's here somewhere. Oh, here we are. The, um, sorry, yeah. I'm going to do a slide share. Sorry, where are we? I disappeared. Here I am. I'm going to do a slide share again to show you this. Um, where is the slide share button? I seem to have lost it. Pramod? Uh, it must be at the bottom of your screen, sir. Please look at it. There must be a green button. Oh, yeah. I found it. Thank you. Okay. Guys, I, I want to show you something because we don't really... Santosh Kumar wants to be admitted. Welcome, Santosh. Look, can you all see this? This is Chinese foreign direct investment in Europe from 2000 to 2018. And these, these are not my numbers. These are the numbers of the Mercator Institute in Berlin. The common lie which is told is the Chinese put all their money into Eastern Europe. Not true. They put 100 million into Estonia. They put 1.9 billion into Greece. They put uh, 900 million into Romania. Their real money has gone 22 billion to Germany, 46 billion to Britain, 14 billion to France, 15 billion to Italy. Even Finland got 7 billion. What they are buying is technology. What they're buying is telecommunication networks. And, you know, this is, as I always tell people now, the new battle between the United States and China is going to be one of the battle for 5G. Because he who puts 5G around the world is going to be the one that dominates the international system. So to answer the question, what is the strategy? I think there is a military strategy. And that military strategy is to contain China, to not make China or not allow China to be a threat to allies like Japan, Taiwan, so on. The economic strategy needs to be revamped. And I think the problem with that is, one, American manufacturing capabilities are low. If you look at corporations now, something very fundamental has changed. You know, 10 years ago, I used to say the Chinese have no brand names. Now, if you go around the world, you see Oppo, Vivo, 
uh, Huawei, you see uh, Geely, you see, um, oh, what is the one, the people who make washing machines? You know? Hisense. Hisense, thank you so yeah. much. Hisense. So on. All these people advertise, when I turn on televisions around the world in hotel rooms, I get these ads. Chinese brands are competing with Western brands. And the next thing that is coming is electric cars. So if you have to compete now, I think the competition lies in two areas, economic power and soft power. And in economic power, you need a different strategy. Because right now in the Indo-Pacific, which concerns you guys, I'm not going to talk Europe, the Chinese with RCEP have a better hold. Okay. Uh, I'll come to COVID-19 and the US-China rivalry in a second. Let, let me talk about the burden sharing thing very briefly. Here's the thing. Nobody in Europe can spend money on defense. Read my article. It lays it out. The Europeans don't like hearing it. But this is the reality. And with COVID-19, you know, the Italians didn't do a good job with COVID-19. And they actually told people above 65, we may or may not be able to give you a ventilator if you fall sick. Now, now that this is under control in Italy, and when they have the next elections, what do you think the elderly population of Italy is going to vote for, the elderly population of Spain, France, Britain, put more money in healthcare? So essentially speaking, the burden sharing part is going down. Weapons procurement is going down because these populations are old. These populations are really old. And again, uh, let me just uh, show you guys something which will probably, these are the oldest populations in the world. Look to the left, Japan, Germany, Martinique, Italy, Portugal, Greece, Bulgaria, Austria, Hong Kong, China, Spain, okay? And these are the youngest populations in the world, Niger, Uganda, Chad, Angola. Niger's median age is 14.8. By 2030, 10 years from now, it goes to 15.2. Okay. Europe is very old. Europe can't do burden sharing. The problem is, and keep this in mind, Europe still does the, we are Europe. We were the great rulers of the world. You know, all this stuff. We have a voice in international affairs. You do have a voice in international affairs. Europe is very good at education. Europe is very good at technology. Uh, Europe has done a lot with issues like human rights and so on. But militarily, it's a thing of the past. I gave the same lecture in Belgium. And I, you know, there's a bunch of young Belgians, just like there's a bunch of young Nepalese listening to what I'm saying today. And I said, in the 1960s, Belgium sent troops to the Congo. Do you believe you could send troops to the Congo today? And they all started laughing. They said, no, today Congo would come to Belgium. And they weren't being sarcastic. They weren't being racist, anything like that. They understood what I was talking about. So forget burden sharing, forget all this. My own take is, NATO is not going to change. And NATO is not going to change because NATO understands that if there's ever a real threat to the European nations, the United States would go in. You know? So if you know that I will intervene, why do you need to spend more money? That, that's it. Let me come to the COVID-19 post world. And there is a lot of rubbish being written right now. You know, it, it's become a growth market. Everybody and their second cousin is writing on what the world is going to look like post COVID-19. Here's your problem. Number one, none of us can effectively chart the trajectory of the virus. Number two, none of us know when a vaccine is going to come. None of us is a pandemic expert. You know, anybody who comes and talks to you about COVID-19, your first question to them is, what are your medical qualifications? Because if you don't have them, you can't discuss this. Okay? But I'm going to now try and discuss COVID-19 in a non-pandemic kind of way and lay this out, having laid out my own limitations here. Number one, there's a lot of talk in Europe, 
in the United States, and I see this in the Indian press, which seems to be uh, licking its chops on this one, that, oh, the world isn't going to trust China after this. And I have a simple logical question here. Which country has said because of COVID-19, we are walking out of the regional comprehensive economic program? The answer is zero. Which country has said, we are going to hold the Chinese accountable? The Australians have talked about it. Do you know what the problem for Australia is? They sell $63 billion worth of commodities, iron ore, copper, to the Chinese. They sell $16 billion worth of natural gas to the Chinese. One fourth of their revenue on tourism comes from the Chinese. They get 1.4 million tourists. Those tourists, uh, who are 1.4 million Chinese tourists, that's 25% of their tourist revenue. And oh, by the way, the largest number of foreign students studying in China are uh, in Australia are Chinese. So when they look at those numbers, they can protest COVID-19, they can talk about let's do this, let's do that. But when the rubber hits the road, what can you do? Now, bring this to the US and China. Here's the thing. What, what are we seeing with COVID-19 in terms of business trends? One, we're seeing a shift from physical to virtual, you know? And what I mean by that is, Five years ago, the only way I could have given this talk was to come to Kathmandu. Today I'm doing it sitting in my living room in Montgomery, Alabama at 8.30 in the morning. We are going to see a much greater transition to virtual over physical. Second thing, and, and I'm quoting Mohammed El Arayan, the uh, international finance uh, expert. Second thing which we are seeing is, we are going to see a movement from efficiency to resiliency in certain areas. And let me explain what I mean by that. In the area of pharmaceuticals and drugs, we found out now that you've had problems. So you, you all know this because you've been following this in the Indian press, that the United States came to India and said, give us more that hydrochloroquine and so on. And the Indians have given it to the US, they've given it to Brazil, so on. A lot of countries are saying we can't depend on Chinese pharmaceutical companies for this in the future. So they're going to set up a lot of this. But keep this in mind, as you set up these industries, these industries will be highly automated with low labor. Uh, 150 kilometers from where I live, Mercedes-Benz is setting up a new car plant to build electric cars. It is a $1 billion factory, but it's only going to employ 300 people. 30 years ago, a car factory in America would employ 15,000 people. So this idea that you're going to see this whole scale shift of production out of China, in some areas, yes. In a lot of areas, no and especially in high tech. But the question of the US and China coming to loggerheads resides in how many countries are willing to move completely away from China. And I do not get that sense in the world. You saw the data on European, uh, uh, sorry, Chinese FTI in Europe. That's only going to increase. And the belief now is that the Italians may be the first country to accept Chinese 5G. You know, the Germans are sitting on the fence. The British have said, we'll allow 35% of 5G to be Chinese. Now they seem to go back on it. They may go back on it again. And I'll just add this one. The Chinese have told the British that that high-speed rail that you want to build from Manchester to think, uh, London, you were saying you're going to build it by 2030, we can build it by 2025, and we'll build it cheaper. That's a very compelling argument for a country which is going to have to pump a lot of money into healthcare. So my own sense is, 
while people are talking about a cold war, while people are talking about a diminishing of Chinese power, I would say in some ways, yes. Certainly, in terms of a moving of some degree of supply chains, but it, you don't see a serious decline in Chinese capacity. And, you know, I, I, I'll say one more thing here, which is really important. We don't know which country is going to be the first one to bring out a vaccine. Because what you see in the press is what you see in the Indian press, the BBC, CNN, uh, you know, Deutsche Welle, all this kind of stuff. They only focus on what's happening in the West. So if you talk to the Indian press, they will tell you AstraZeneca, which is an American pharmaceutical company, is working with Oxford Institute and the Serum Institute, uh, Institute uh, Oxford University, and the Serum Institute in Pune to make a, vi uh, a vaccine. The Chinese have been looking at vaccines since January. And they only gave the DNA of the virus to the rest of the world in March. So they are two to three months ahead of everybody else. Now, if they come up with a vaccine, and they say, we give it to the whole world. We're not going to be like a pharmaceutical multinational and charge exorbitant amounts of money for it. What does that do for China in the new China-America post-COVID-19 situation? And I, I, I want all of you to remember this. Most of you are too young to remember this. In the 1980s and the 1990s, the big pandemic was going to be AIDS. It was spreading across Africa. South Africa actually saw its population life expectancy decline because of AIDS. Central African Republic saw its life expectancy decline because of AIDS. The Western drug manufacturing companies were charging an arm and a leg for these drugs. Indian companies made AIDS cocktails and sold them for the fraction of the price in South Africa. When you come to solutions in a globalized world, it's not necessarily from the West to the rest of the world. It can be from anywhere. And again, let me remind you of this. People are looking at South Korea and Vietnam to see how to contain Corona because the Vietnamese have done a very good job with it. It's the Cubans who send medical brigades of doctors to Spain and other countries. The entire world is connecting up in ways which we wouldn't have seen possible 30 years ago. Okay, uh, I'll take some other questions if you have any. Okay, we have lots of questions. Um, uh, okay. I'll, I'll send you three set of questions. Uh, it appears that United States often forget the principle of, principle of balance of power theory. The policymakers of the U.S. are blamed of failing, failing to recognize how balance of power logic not only drive the behavior of their allies but also of their adversaries. Is it actually the truth? Uh, second is that uh, T. Paul and his colleague in his book *Balance of Power: Theories and Practice in the 21st Century* argues that multipolarity since the 18th century and bipolarity since 1945 did not last long and similarly United States hegemony won't last too long. Eventually it will end. So what do you, what do you think about this? Uh, third is that what is the future of gastronomy or people to government diplomacy? If it works on India, how will it work? How it will be or India will not, it's not very clear. Uh, how it will be or India will not play with the culinary that are more interested to border issues of Nepal that have just something to do, like they are, they're trying to connect with that. Uh, another question is, US has emphasized on soft power, on culinary diplomacy or gastro diplomacy, how it will work in future. And in the other hand, China is not using its soft power at all, what I understand. But in Taiwan, Macau, we, we can see the effect of culinary diplomacy and if China China's thinking about community, what will be the biggest step for global era? These are a few of the questions. We have three more, we'll put in the second half. Okay, I'll, I'll take as many questions as you want me to. Look, on the balance of power thing, what you have to remember is, 
balance of power is not static, it's fluid, you know? And in balance of power, essentially what happens is both sides or multiple sides try to in keep increasing their power, other sides keep balancing them. It's not like you reach a balance and say, okay, we're all happy now. Because events keep changing around the world, internally countries develop their capabilities, and internally countries change their views. So saying that the US is against balance of power is probably not the right thing. Saying that the US, like others, is fluid in its approach to balance of power is probably the right thing. You know? and, and I'll give you one simple example out of history. Otto Bismarck made it very clear that Germany would be a land power. And the British would be the sea power. So there was no clash between British and German interests for a long period of time. Kaiser Wilhelm II comes to power and says, our future lies in water. Now you have the British-German naval rivalry. So countries seek to shift balance of power because they think that they are losing out on something. I think that's the way of answering that. I don't want to get too much into it because I'm not a fan of realist theory. Okay? On the TV, Paul, point, yes. Look, let me put it to you this way. Okay? You've all read Kenneth Neal Waltz, Mersheimer, all these people. Kenneth Neal Waltz used to say bipolarity is the best thing that ever happened. After bipolarity went away, everybody said unipolarity is the best thing that ever happened. What is the theoretical basis for making this argument? What is the empirical basis for making this argument? It doesn't exist. And as I always tell people, you know, my, one of the people who taught me was Hedley Bull. Hedley Bull's co-author was a man called Martin White. Martin White used to say American political uh, inter But if you look at the ridiculous politics of Britain between the Brexit vote and the re-election or the election of Boris Johnson in 2019, I mean, that is not a testimony to a two-party system being stable. You know? That's just utter chaos. I think, and, and this is where TV Paul is right, these things last for a while because balance of power is fluid. Other people come up, you weaken. You weaken internally, you know, or you shift internally in your focus. Look, look at a country like Japan. Japan was big realist theory component, building up its power in the 1930s, 1940s. Today, Japan is a country which is not seeking to expand its military power. It shifted. Is Japan a very rich country, though? Well, the answer is yes. Is Japan a technologically advanced country? The answer is yes. No? People's priorities shift. Uh, this gastronomy question, I am not sure what it is, but let me tell you, let me put it to you this way, okay? As somebody who travels around the world and eats food around the world, what, what I'm seeing around the world is Everybody is now, you know, you go anywhere in the world today, you can get hamburgers. There is a McDonald's in most countries in the world. Um, you can get Kentucky Fried Chicken. You can get Chinese cuisine. You can get Mexican cuisine. I can go down the list on this. And, you know, it's very interesting in America now, you're seeing a fusion of cuisine. The last time I was in uh, Los Angeles, a friend of mine took me to eat at a food truck. That was a truck by the side of the road and they were serving tacos. So I asked the guy, I said, what is your specialty? He said, Korean tacos. I said, what is a Korean taco? And what they do is in a taco, they put Korean bulgogi, which is Korean meat, barbecue meat. And they serve it because this guy figured out that he used to go to what were Korean neighborhoods in Los Angeles. And they loved the idea that made tacos, which, you know, was food just like their mother made. 
And what is happening in terms of soft power? This is the interesting thing. American food used to be, you know, steak and mashed potatoes and boring stuff like that. Ethnic food in America used to be spaghetti. Now what is ethnic food in America is Indian, Chinese, Filipino, Korean, Mexican, you name it, you know, everywhere. But it's more interesting than that. Gastronomically, the Americans are sending this food outside the world now. Yeah. So it's the American version of tacos that's going around the world, not the Mexican version. It's the American version of Chinese food. There is now a Chinese, um, there is now a version of Chinese food called California Chinese cuisine. That is going around the world. Now, can the Chinese compete in that? The answer is not really, nor are they interested because they have a huge, there's a Chinese diaspora of 60 million people who cook Chinese food around the world. Now, what's interesting is, if you go to a, China, a real Chinese restaurant in Kathmandu, they are cooking Chinese, but they're cooking it to Nepalese tastes. So they don't cook it the way, and I'm sure you've seen this promote because you've had authentic Chinese food and then you've had what passes for Chinese food in Kathmandu and what passes for Chinese food in New Delhi. It's not the same. The Chinese shape their food to, sweet, uh, sorry, to suit the palates of the people who they live with. And they're very good at that. You know, uh, if you go to a Chinese restaurant in Montgomery, Alabama, most of them are buffets now. And in those buffets, they have pizza. And I asked the owner, I said, why do you have pizza in a Chinese restaurant? He said, because people bring their children. And the children are not used to the spices and the way the Chinese food is cooked but the children love pizza. So we keep pizza for the children. For the parents, we keep serious Chinese food. I mean, this is the way the Chinese do it. They are highly adaptable, you know? It, 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 is, it is this kind of thing. And um, I will tell you this though, I, I want to talk a little bit about Nepalese cuisine because the, this is really interesting. In two cities in America, I've actually had authentic Nepalese cuisine. One is Madison, Wisconsin, and the other is St. Louis, Missouri, where they have Nepalese restaurants. And, and, and it's cooked Nepalese style. It isn't like South Indian style or Punjabi style where, you know, you put that much spice in the food and so on. And it, it's done very differently. The, the rotis are done Nepalese style. They're not done Punjabi style. So it was a real pleasure to hit, eat a different kind of cuisine there. Uh, I should also add this about Nepalese. Um, you should be very proud of your country now because there are more Nepalese students in America than there are Pakistani students in America. And Nepal is what now, 30 million people, 29 million people? Pakistan is 208 million people. So the, the Nepalese educational diaspora keeps getting bigger and bigger. And we're seeing more Nepalese food around the world. You know? And you are adapting too. I mean, you go to these Nepalese restaurants, you get momos. And I laugh when I see that because I tell them, but this isn't Nepalese food. They said, yeah, but you know, here people think anything coming from Asia looks the same. So they laugh, you know. But if, if you're looking at this in terms of soft power, I'll say one thing. The Chinese is now spending close to $7 billion promoting their soft power around the world. They've set up Confucius Institutes everywhere. I'm sure there is one in uh, Kathmandu. Yeah. Uh, they have, um, uh, they are also putting a lot of uh, money into Hollywood. You know, the Mission Impossible movies, uh, the Avengers movies, so on. If you look at Hollywood now, it makes 30% of its revenue in America. It makes 70% around the world. It makes a lot. then we want Hollywood to make movies in China. And what they're doing because of this is, if you've noticed over the last 10 years or so, no movie shows China in a bad light. 
Those days are gone where you could show the Chinese as being evil because they put so much money into Hollywood movies. So if you watch the Doctor Strange movie, which I'm sure many of you have, in that the ancient one is supposed to be a Tibetan. That was changed to a white woman in the movie because they didn't want to offend Chinese sentiments. So the Chinese are actually good at soft power. They have something called the Office of Foreign Propaganda. So they don't even lie about it. They say it's propaganda, we do it. You know? And they do it rather well. Uh, everybody in the world is doing this. Uh, I should point out, and then I'll take the next set of questions. The most interesting experience I had in Kathmandu was two nights in a row, and I don't know if this restaurant is still there or not. We went and ate at the North Korean restaurant, the Pyongyang or whatever it's called. You know, next to, the, next to the hotel I was staying in. And I said, what the hell is this thing? So we went there and it was authentic North Korean food. And then they came out as an all North Korean girl band and they sang the, Be the Beatles song, My, My, My Beautiful Sunday. And I'm like, if you wrote this up, nobody would believe it. You know? But they were, they're there. And New York Times did an article on this and said one of the reasons they're setting these up is it's to A, try and make foreign currency, but it's also to try and project North Korea around the world. And the Nepalese government was kind enough to let the North Koreans in. But it, it was, I have to tell you this, it was the most interesting experience I've had in terms of globalization and interaction of global cultures in the world. And by the way, they had private booths where the high spending people were, all Chinese, all Chinese. We, the poor people were sitting out on the long tables and eating with the common people, you know? Inside, it was the rich Chinese getting a catered custom uh, banquet and so on. Okay, uh, I'll take some more questions. Oh, thank you, sir. Uh, this is the last round. Okay. Uh, what is your forecast on U.S. strategic policy towards the Philippines in line with South China Sea dispute that has been dividing ASEAN in defense and security pillar? That is code of conduct. Second is, after COVID-19, how will U.S. be challenged by China and the way British Empire was challenged after World War II and U.S. as well as Russia dominated the international system till 1990, USSR? Uh, where will Russia, India, Germany, and Brazil fit in? Third is, do we see a rise of India in the global order with the American inclination towards uh, looking for an allies in its struggle against China? Fourth is, how optimistic are you about the Russia-US nuclear talk on the table? What, according to you, will be the best possible scenario? Why are US and Russia losing confidence in global order mechanism like the START? or even the Paris Accord or the open skies. Uh, we still have two questions, but I think we don't have much time. Just a few minutes. Look, I'll, I'll go through these. Questions. And if there's any time left, I'll take the last two. And I don't mind going five minutes over because if okay. people had the patience to hang around and listen to me talk, I should show the courtesy to answer the okay. question. Okay. Look, on the Philippines, here's the interesting thing. Go back to RCEP, go back to BRI. And there's several elements to this. If you look at Regional Comprehensive Program and BRI, it has shifted the way people are thinking about a lot of things. Uh, President Duterte, before he got elected, said he was going to jet ski to the South China Sea Islands. After he got elected, he said, I am going to be part of BRI and I want Chinese money. So this has to be balanced. Second part in this you've got to keep in mind is all these South China Sea islands are all occupied now. You know, so there's no such a thing as a gray area. All the islands have been occupied by different countries. The only way you can change this is war. And nobody's talking about war right now. The Chinese are building up those rocks and, you know, putting sand on them and bringing tourists in, though why would you go as this a tourist to the South China Sea Islands is beyond me. But it's a, it's a Chinese policy. The third thing which is really interesting is, after the India-Bangladesh maritime settlement, you know, which was done under international arbitration, 
that became the template that ASEAN presented to the Chinese and said, look, this is how the Indians agreed to share it. Why don't you agree? And the, the thing is, my, my sense on this is it's not going to be a US driven solution. It's going to be an ASEAN China driven solution. And bear this in mind, ASEAN diplomats are remarkably competent diplomats. Now they have their disagreements between themselves. The Vietnamese have a particular position. The Singaporeans have a particular position. But overall, these are very smart people. And what they're saying is, let's all make money and let's try and settle this diplomatically. The, the, I, my own sense is for the Philippines, this is going to be how they negotiate it. And they will negotiate it through ASEAN to, for strength with the Chinese. It's not going to be about the US and the Philippines. This is my personal opinion. And do keep this in mind. What I'm talking to you about today is as a international relations scholar, not as a uh, representative of the United States Air Force or the Department of Defense. That is one. Uh, two, on the US being challenged by China, will it be like the UK post Second World War? Here's the thing. US is not in decline. You know, Fred Zakaria wrote that book years ago saying the US is not in decline, other people have come up. And what you have to keep in mind is there are fundamental differences between the US and the British. The British Empire stopped paying for itself in 1919. And in 1916, as Adam Tooze points out, America became the richest country in the world. And what happened was because America was the richest country in the world, Britain as the most powerful country in the world could do nothing about the Great Depression. Now, Come to 1945, Britain is decimated. Britain goes into food rationing. And the British remove food rationing in 1954. For nine years after the Second World War, they had food rationing. Now in today's world, we are seeing the rise of China. We're seeing all kinds of things. The largest producer of agricultural products in the world today. And for the last hundred years, has been the United States of America. You're never going to see food rationing in this country. You're not going to see this country lose its technological edge. You are not going to see this country lose its educational advantage. Though it is being pushed hard by China, I must say, and which is good, because when you have competition, you improve. So I think, you know, problem with historical analogies is they don't work well. I mean, they're nice to throw around, but they don't work well. Britain became an absurd military power. And in Britain, even today, you get all this, the British Commonwealth. I mean, who cares? No. Who cares? Uh, keep this in mind, when the Delhi Commonwealth Games were held, Usain Bolt didn't show up, said, I don't want to run in this. It's a waste of my time. Okay. Britain, France, all this is the old Europe. And I don't mean it in the sense that it was used by Donald Rumsfeld, but it's a different kind of thinking about the world. The U.S. will remain economically engaged in the world. The U.S. will remain military, militarily engaged where it's very important and critical to the U.S. Certainly things will happen where there will be discussions with the Chinese and the Chinese will be more influential. We may have a Cold War. I don't know. I don't know. You know? And remember one thing. We are right now in an election year, which leads to all kinds of complications. Next year will be interesting to see what happens. So that would be my take on that. On the BRICS and India, let me put it this way. Uh, there is a BRICS bank whose initial capitalization was $50 billion. 40 billion came from the Chinese, 10 billion came from the RIC, uh, came from the RIS, which is Russia, India, and uh, South Africa. When you talk BRICS, you're really talking about the Chinese. When you talk Shanghai Cooperation Organization, you're really talking about the Chinese. When you talk Asian Infrastructure Bank, you're really talking about the Chinese. Having said that, there is a lot that can be done. There is a lot that can be done in terms of scientific cooperation, technological cooperation, and perspectives on the world. You know. 
on world order and so on, where I think countries like Brazil, India, and so on can play. About India being a great power, let me put it this way to you. I think India needs to spend the next 20 years building up its healthcare, building up its education so it can be a knowledge economy, and building up its general economy. Then you can talk in terms of great powers, so on. India will always be an influential country because it's so large, it has fingers in so many pies. But to be a great power, it's going to have to build up those criteria which other countries have used to be a great power. And lastly, on the US-Russia nuclear talks, look, let me put it this way. Uh, you know, we've been sitting for years and decades and saying that all treaties are set in stone. They're not. During the Bush administration, they got rid of the ABM treaty. And there was screams through Washington, D.C. about, oh, my God, we got rid of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. We'll have a new Cold War with the Russians. Nothing happened. And now, you know, Donald Trump is talking about walking away from open skies, walking away from other things. Some of these treaties are old. The world has changed. Technology has changed. They have to be negotiated. Having said that, the real issue to me is how do you make the Russians recognize that their biggest problem is not the US, Europe, irredentism in the Ukraine or whatever. Their biggest problem is as an economy, they still depend on the export of commodities. And do keep this in mind about the Russians. They are incredibly smart people. You know, you look at the technological capabilities of Russians, you look at the scientific capabilities of Russians, you look at the research Russians do in the social sciences, it's amazing. But none of this has been translated into building up a world economy, a world-class economy. And keep this in mind, uh, Russia becomes a, you know, nominally a democracy in 1991. In 30 years, they have created no global brand names. The global brand names are still the global brand names of the Cold War, Sukhoi, Mig, Kalashnikov. And what are the global brand names of the Chinese, Oppo, Vivo, uh, Hisense, you know, go down the list. And just may I add one thing about this. I said this in India and it upset everybody. Uh, the Indian cricket team at the last World Cup does anybody remember who their sponsor was? It was Oppo. So the Chinese cell phone company is sponsoring the Indians while Doklam is going on. You know? So you, you got to remember this and keep this in context. Now, the Indians were uh, sponsoring uh, the Afghan cricket team with Amut, the butter manufacturers and the cheese manufacturers. And that also gives you an idea of the relative uh, levels of economic capability of both countries. My own sense is the real thing for Russia now is the West has to talk to Russia and say, how do we work with you to make your economy into a genuine G8 economy rather than this economy which is skewed towards still essentially building products and exporting products that you used to during the Cold War. Okay, those last two questions. I will do it in less than five minutes. Uh, in recent interview, President Trump seems to suggest South Korea or Japan to get nuclear weapons. Additionally, the U.S. withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal two years ago. This led prominent organizations, including the United Nations and the European Union, to be deeply uh, worried maybe about a series of new conflict and instability. How do you think U.S. allies deal with what the world claims as classic Trumpism? The last question is, uh, Dr. Amit pointed out about reducing military military of Europe. It's not so clear. A Cypriot study suggests that if Germany had spent the same percentage of GDP on its military as Russia did in 2017, a uh, Germany military budget alone would have been 2.4 times than that of Russia. Moreover, in 2018, the U.S. alone accounted for 35 percent of world's total military spending. So, what is that? U.S. has been building with strong military power for this huge amount just for data China. Okay. Uh, 
let me just write down the question so I can look. The, here's the thing: the Japanese. The, there are people who say, "Oh, the Japanese want nuclear weapons." It is deeply rooted in Japanese culture, anti-nuclearization. So, the suggestion may have been made. I don't think it's going to happen in the near future. It may happen 10, 15 years from now. But look, if you go to Japan, and I've been to Hiroshima, and you go to their peace park and you go to their peace museum, they bring in school children from all over Japan to look at it. And the reason they do that is they want their people to know, look, this is what happened to us. And even today in Japan, you, you, you talk to scholars, you talk to the military, you use the word nuclear, they're not happy. And as the Japanese point out, we've had three nuclear incidents. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Fukuyama. Uh, sorry, uh, what is it? Yeah, fu not Fukuyama. Yeah, Fukuyama. You know, we've had these three. We can't afford to have a fourth. So you may get pronouncements out of Washington. Ultimately speaking, Japan has to decide to invest. And that's not going to happen. In the South Korean case, again, you know, the South Koreans are quite happy with the American umbrella, military umbrella. The South Koreans agreed to allow the United States to put pad uh, anti-aircraft, anti-missile defenses in South Korea. And that was partly the concern of the North Korea. But you know, here's your problem with North Korea. When you talk to the people who look at North Korea, they all say the same thing. Seoul is what, 50 kilometers from the border. The North Koreans can shell it and bomb it and kill a lot of people. They don't need to use a nuclear weapon to do that. That part is there. But I will tell you, there is some very interesting speculative thinking happening in some, uh, among some academics in America, which is not the government, but academics, which is what if the Kim regime goes away or what if you have North Korean, South Korean reunification? If that ever happened, you automatically have a nuclear Korea and then what? You know? But again, my point to you is don't look at what the US says. Look at what these countries say, because ultimately these countries have to take the step. And the US is not going to show up at the doorstep of uh, Prime Minister Abe and say, here's a nuclear weapon. That's not how it's going to happen. It's going to be a Mitsubishi bomb or a Honda bomb or a Kawasaki bomb. You know? So the, this is what I think is important there. On, why so much you, uh, on the Iran nuclear deal Look, Here's the thing. The belief was that it, it was going to be renegotiated. It's gone into the background now. It's gone completely into the background now because with COVID, the world's attention has changed, so on. And again, the question is, are the Iranians crossing the nuclear Rubicon? Because even if the deal, and remember, the Europeans are still in the deal somehow. The US isn't. But the Iranians have not yet made that major shift towards overt nuclearization. That happens, then we've got a completely different issue. Right now, yeah, the optics may not be particularly good, which is you're out of a nuclear deal. But Boots on the ground reality is something very different. And I'll end with US military power. Look, here's the thing. You're, you're absolutely right. The US spends more than anybody else. But what does US military power give the United States? It gives it economic influence, it gives it political influence, and it also reassures its allies. If you pull, you know, till recently, Till the military rise of China, if you had pulled American troops out of Northeast Asia, the most powerful military became Japan. And ask the Koreans, ask the Chinese, ask the Filipinos what they think about a military powerful Japan. If you pulled 
American troops out of Germany in the Cold War, the most militarily powerful nation would have been Germany. That's why Lord Ismay, the British uh, um, politician said, NATO is there to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. No, that, that, that rationale has gone. But the point was, by having your troops everywhere, you had a certain degree of economic influence. So Europe could never be protectionist because the United States could always say, you want to do economic protectionism and trade protectionism? What about uh, 250,000 troops sitting in your continent giving you security? And the answer always was, oh, okay, we'll make concessions. And it was the same thing with the Japanese. So there, there, is, there were good, solid economic reasons for it. My argument to you, and I'll end with this, is there has to be now increasing talk about world order, a new economic template, much in the way of you know, what the Marshall Plan was, and essentially sitting down with the Chinese, with the Brazilians, with everybody and saying, look, A, what do you think world order should look like, but B, and this goes back to the question about India, and I'll end with that one. What are you willing to contribute? Because, you know, you've all heard about the Quad, and I didn't want to talk about it because I think the Quad is exaggerated. And, and I'll give you two examples. A lot of talk about the Quad from all four countries. The two who are serious about it are the US and Japan. The two who aren't are the Indians and the Australians. You know, the Australians very clearly, when they talk about the Quad, are not talking about going and fighting in the South China Sea. What they're talking about is providing support but most importantly, giving political and diplomatic support to the Quad. The Indians are talking about political diplomatic support. They're talking less about military. And you can't. If you're the Indian Navy, you can't go into the South China Sea. It's too far away and you would be a sitting duck. You know? It's as simple as that. And I, I could talk more on that, but I don't want to because of time constraints. Uh, let me put it this way. The new world order that is coming is going to require us to look at things differently. IR theory, out of the window. Cold War politics, out of the window. And part of this is going to come with the generational change. I'm going to give you the names of four women, and I want you to check this. Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, is 39 years old. Sana Marin, the Prime Minister of Finland, is 34 years old. Malala, the education and women's rights activist, is what, 21, 22 years old. And Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist, is 16 years old. Now, what is the lifespan of all these people? New Zealanders live to be in the mid-80s. So my take is Jacinda Ardern will live till 2060, 2065. Finns live to be 85. So Sana Marin will live for another 50 years. She'll live till 2070. Malala will probably live till she's 80. So she will live till 2080. And Greta Thunberg, because Swedes live till their late 80s, will probably live for another 70 years. She will live till 2090. Will John Mersheimer be alive in 2090? Will Henry Kissinger be alive in 2090? Will Donald Trump be alive in 2090? Will Boris Johnson be alive? Will Macron be alive? Will Merkel be alive? Everybody will be dead. And what I want all of you to look at, because I, I like to end my lectures on a note of hope. What do Sana Marin, Jacinda Ardern, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's 30, so she lived for another 50 years, so she'll be alive to 2070. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Malala, and Greta Thunberg have in common. They say the environment matters, poverty matters, healthcare matters, education matters. That is the focus of the politicians of the future. So, you know, to my mind, yeah, Henry Kissinger should be sitting with his grandchildren and playing, or great grandchildren now. Same thing with all these people. I want all of you to look at what these young people are saying because they're people in your age group. And tell me, 
I never thought a 34 year old could become the prime minister of any country. But that is the reality today. And when that 34 year old prime minister with her ideas about environment and healthcare and women's rights sits with a 55 year old Boris Johnson and a 65 year old Angela Merkel, do you think there is a difference? And a 74 year old Donald Trump, do you think there is a difference in thinking? And which one do you identify with? Because if you want to identify with the Cold War, go with it. You know, um, I tell young people now, you have ideas, I have money. Because I've reached that age now that I can think in terms of retirement and so on. Tell me how to put my money to make your life better, because you're going to live till 2070 or 2090. I really don't want to live till 2070, because I'll be over 100 years old, and somebody will have to push me around in a wheelchair. All right, thank you. Thank you, sir. It was really enlightening. We learned a lot and thank you very much for your time. Maybe we'll, we'd love to have you again on some other topics.